Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a student talking to the student accommodation officer at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I've just been accepted on a course at the university, and I'd like to try and arrange accommodation in the Hall of Residence. Yes, certainly. Uh, please sit down. What I'll do is fill in a form with you to find out a little more about your preferences and so forth. Thank you. So, first of all, um, can I take your name? It's Anu Bhatt. Could you spell your name, please? Yes. A-N-U-B-H-A-T-T. Thanks. And could I ask your date of birth? The 31st of March, 1972. Thank you. And where are you from? India. Oh, right. And um, what will you be studying? I'm doing a course in nursing. Right, thank you. And how long would you want to stay in Hall, do you think? Well, it'll take three years, but I'd only like to stay in Hall for two. I'd like to think about living outside for the third year. Fine. And what did you have in mind for catering? Do you want to cook for yourself or have all your meals provided? That's full board. Is there something in between? Yes, you can just have evening meal provided, which is half board. That's what I'd prefer. Yes, a lot of students uh, opt for that. Now, with that in mind, do you have any special diet, anything we should know about? Yes, I don't take red meat. No red meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, thinking about the room itself, we have a number of options. Uh, you can have a single study bedroom or you can have a shared one. These are both what we call simple rooms. The other alternative is to opt for a single bedsit, which actually has more space and better facilities. Uh, there's about £20 a week difference between them. Well... Actually, my grant is quite generous, and I think the bed seat sounds the best option. Lovely. I'll put you down for that, and we'll see what availability is like. Now, can I ask some other personal details which we like to have on record? Yes, of course. I wonder if you could let us know what your interests are. This might help us get a closer match for placing you in a particular hall. Um, well, I love the theatre. Right. And I enjoy sports, particularly badminton. Ah, that's worth knowing. Now, what we finish with on the form is really a list from you of what your priorities are in choosing a hall. And we'll do our best to take these into account. Well, the first thing is I'd prefer a hall where there are other mature students, if possible. Yes, we do have halls which tend to cater for slightly older students. Mm. Uh, and I'd prefer to be out of town. That's actually very good for you because we tend to have more vacancies in out-of-town halls. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else? Well, I would like somewhere with a shared area, a, a TV room, for example, or, or something like that. It's a good way to socialise. It certainly is. That's it. Now, we just need a contact telephone number for you. Oh, uh, sure, I'll just find it. Um, it's uh, double six 
7549. Great. So we'll be in contact with you as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hello. Can I help you? Ah, oh, yes. I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm -hmm. But of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the Tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. Obviously, there are more bus stops, uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. <sighs> you will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day and then around London when I'm here. Hmm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The Tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. Huh. Of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times, whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then? Right, well, you can choose. Uh, we're here at the Information Office, OK? Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop. 
opposite the bank. Uh-huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages. Uh. If you want to take the train, walk down the high street towards the city. Go past the bank, and on your left is the station, mm -hmm. just before you get to the post office. Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there. Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first. Huh. To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the high street. Then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right opposite the cinema. Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi. <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a seminar with Dr Martin Merriweather of the Antarctic Centre in Christchurch, New Zealand. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We're pleased to welcome Dr Martin Merriweather of the Antarctic Centre in Christchurch, New Zealand, who has come along to talk to us today about the role of the centre and the Antarctic Treaty. Now my first question is about the choice of location for the centre. Why Christchurch? Was it because of the climate? Well, actually, New Zealand is the second closest country to Antarctica, and Christchurch is often used on Antarctic expeditions. Right, so it's because of where we are, coupled with our historical role. So tell us, what is the main purpose of the centre? Oh, well, we have two complementary roles. One is as a scientific base for expeditions and research, and the other is as an information centre. Tell us something about the role as a scientific base. Well, we're able to provide information about what scientists should take with them to the South Pole. For example, the centre contains a clothing warehouse where expeditions are supplied with suitable clothing for the extreme conditions. I suppose you need a bit more than your normal winter coat. Yes, exactly. And then there's also the specialist library and mapping services. Right. And which countries are actually located at the centre? Well, the centre houses research programmes for New Zealand, for the United States as well as for Italy. There's even a US post office at the American Air Force Base here. Really? And what does the visitor centre offer? Well, since very few people will ever experience the Antarctic firsthand, the visitor centre aims to recreate the atmosphere of Antarctica. There's a mock campsite where you can see inside an Antarctic tent and imagine yourself sleeping there. <laughs> and the centre also acts as a showcase for the unique internal cooperation which exists in Antarctica today. What is it actually like at the South Pole? I know you've been there on a number of occasions. Yes, I have. And each time I'm struck by the 
awesome beauty of the place. It's magnificent, but you can really only visit it in the summer months. October to March. Yes, because it's completely dark for four months of the year. And in addition, it has to be the coldest place on Earth. Colder than the North Pole? Why is that? Ah, well, unlike the North Pole, which is actually a frozen sea, Antarctica is a landmass shaped like a dome, with the result that the winds blow down the slopes at speeds of up to 150 kilometres an hour. And that's what makes it so cold. Oh. And one other interesting thing is that Antarctica is the driest continent on Earth, surprisingly, and so you have to drink large amounts of water when you're there. How old is, an old is Antarctica? Oh, we're pretty sure it was part of a larger landmass, but it broke away from the rest of the continent 170 million years ago. How can you be certain of this? Because fossils and rocks have been discovered in Antarctica, which are the same as those found in places such as Africa and Australia. Amazing. To think that it was once attached to Africa. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, let's just have a look at the Antarctic Treaty. How far back does the idea of an international treaty go? Well, as far back as the 19th century, when 11 nations organised an international event. When was that exactly? In 1870, and it was called the Polar Research Meeting. And then, not long after that, they organised something called the First International Polar Year. And that took place when exactly? Over two years, from 1882 to 1883. But it wasn't until the 1950s that the idea of an international treaty was proposed. And in 1959, the treaty was actually signed. What do you see as the main achievements of the treaty? Well, firstly, it means that the continent is reserved for peaceful use. That's Article 1, isn't yeah. it? Yes. That's important. The territory belongs to everyone. Yes, but not as important as Article 5, which prohibits any nuclear explosions or waste disposal. Which is marvellous. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there because I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thanks for coming along today and telling us all about the centre and its work. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 40.
OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has any... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Absolutely. Conquering the IELTS listening section requires a strategic approach. Here's a roadmap to boost your skills. Sharpen your ear for diverse accents. The IELTS exam throws accents from various corners of the English-speaking world at you. To conquer this, immerse yourself in English from different regions. Watch news channels like BBC World News or CNN International, listen to podcasts on a variety of topics, or find movies and TV shows with diverse casts. Prioritize grasping the gist, not every detail. Don't get bogged down trying to understand every single word. Focus on the overall message and key points. The speaker might rephrase things or use synonyms, that's okay. The test assesses your ability to grasp the general flow of information. Become a note-taking ninja. Jot down important details while listening. This could be names, dates, places, or specific actions mentioned. Keywords and short phrases will jog your memory when answering questions later. Practice makes perfect. There's a treasure trove of practice materials available online and in libraries. Look for practice tests that mirror the IELTS format, with recordings featuring different accents and question types. This will familiarize you with the structure and hone your ability to identify key information under time pressure. Additional tips. Pre-listening is your friend. When you get a chance, quickly scan the questions before the recording starts. This gives you an idea of what to listen out for and helps you focus your attention. Don't get stuck on one question. If you can't answer a question right away, move on and come back to it later if you have time. Don't waste precious time dwelling on a single difficult one. Review your mistakes. After completing a practice test, analyze your errors. Were you missing key details, struggling with a particular accent, or getting flustered by time pressure? Understanding your weak spots allows you to target them for improvement. By consistently practicing these strategies and immersing yourself in diverse English, you'll be